to the Museum of Nebraska History's ongoing uh, noon forum lectures. I'm John Carter and I'm with the uh, uh, State Historical Society's Research and Publication Division and am pleased to begin uh, a new series in our regular uh, program, uh, the Thursday afternoon lecture series, uh, that will uh, go along with our uh, programming dealing with civil liberties and civil rights called We the People. And in that uh, enterprise, we're asking ourselves a very important question. Who is the we? Who gets involved with that? Um, today, our first lecturer in this series is a very special one, at least to me. Um, uh, let me start by thanking the people that made this possible. Um, uh, the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation uh, allows us to share these lectures with a much wider audience uh, uh, through uh, uh, Cable Access Channel 5, and we really appreciate that. More than that, the uh, uh, Nebraska State Historical Foundation, Historical Society Foundation, has helped us <clears throat> bring the resources together uh, to do uh, this project, the specific project, We the People. We also have had some very good friends and would uh, like to thank very specifically the Nebraska Humanities Council that supported both the exhibit that we're doing and the speakers that we're bringing in. And then our other friends, the Woods Charitable Fund and the Cooper Foundation that have uh, substantially supported our programming. And finally, the uh, Lincoln Journal Star, who have stepped up and uh, uh, given us a lot of support in letting we the people know that we are doing these things. Uh, today our speaker, like I said, is an important one to me. Um, uh, you, you don't need to talk about Leela Knox Shanks a lot because her name appears in a lot of different places. Um, she has for a long time been involved in issues dealing with civil and human rights um, and I think is one of those people that I would point to as the model citizen, the, the person who uh, is engaged in the political process uh, which is important because sitting home and doing nothing is not being a model citizen. Voting is your minimum obligation, but also following what's going on and responding to the uh, leadership in the political world is really what citizens ought to be doing. And uh, Mrs. Shanks is the poster child for that enterprise, I think. Um, she's also a journalist and writes widely. Um, and in a very different way, uh, uh, an important contributor, uh, her book, Your Name is Hughes Hannibal Shanks, uh, is a trip into the uh, personal power of what happens when a loved one is afflicted with Alzheimer's disease. One, and from personal experience, I can tell you, one of the really evil things on the face of the planet. Uh, but that's not why she's here today. We're asking Mrs. Shanks to be here from a, uh, another point of view, and it's important to our conversation because when we talk about civil rights, civil liberties, and social justice, we think of the political system, the three branches of government, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial, but the important one, the one empowered by the First Amendment to the Constitution, a free and robust press. But then the question becomes, who watches the Fourth Estate? And Mrs. Shanks is going to talk today about some work she did. She did this presentation, and it's one of the reasons I was excited to bring her back. Uh, a number of years ago at a conference we put together up in Omaha on African American history where she looked at how the fourth estate looked at citizens of African American descent. And so I can promise you that this is a powerful moment to look at 
uh, the very specific world we live in and how we, the people, are represented by the fourth estate. It is my grand delight to in introduce you to Leela Shanks. Thank you. Wouldn't I have done that? Yes, I did. <laughs> I wanted to see how good you were on your feet. <laughs> good afternoon. I'm so thankful that I could be here today physically. And thank you to the Historical Society for inviting me. It's a real honor and privilege to be able to participate in a project on civil liberties and civil rights, especially at this time when people all over the world are risking their lives for freedom and liberty. And so I'm happy to be able to be here. And I want to thank John and the two Kylies for doing this PowerPoint presentation of my visuals. I would like to share with you a survey of the evolving image of African Americans in the Nebraska press from 1950 to 2000. As a journalist, I wanted to research and study how and what the Nebraska press had reported on African Americans from the first issue of the first newspaper published in Nebraska in 1867 to the year 2000. My primary sources for information were the Nebraska Historical Society, the Lincoln Journal Star, and the Omaha World Herald. And those, of course, are both daily newspapers. I also used two weekly newspapers, the Omaha Star, published, of course, in Omaha, as, as John has mentioned, and The Voice, which was a weekly published here in Lincoln. And um, <clears throat> I specifically examined 469 news clippings in the library of the Lincoln Journal Star and 141 clippings from the Omaha World Herald at the Douglas County Historical Society. These were the total number of clippings filed under the various labels for African Americans. And of course, the titles evolved from colored to Negro, to Afro-American, to black, and then to African-American. I examined issues of the Omaha Star from its first edition in 1938 to 2000, and I examined issues of The Voice from its first edition, 1946, to the last issue published in 1953. I also read hundreds of other articles clipped from the Lincoln Journal Star and the Omaha World Herald that was filed under other titles, but stories that affected the lives of African Americans, such as uh, stories on the Ku Klux Klan and the Nazi Party in Nebraska and others. For articles from the earliest newspapers, I read them on microfiche, and that was probably the hardest part about this project, learning how to operate those machines and then reading the almost unreadable print, which, of course, was over 100 years old. As an old newspaper person, I came to the research thinking in terms of organizing the stories by the sections in the newspapers, such as national news, women's news, sports news, entertainment, and so forth. But early into the project, I realized that the stories on African Americans seldom fit into what would be called conventional sections in the paper and I found that I had to come up with new classifications for news stories on African Americans. But before beginning the survey, as background, 
I would like to share some of the earliest images and stories on African Americans in Nebraska newspapers in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. And I started my research <coughs> by reading the first issue of the first newspaper published in Nebraska in the Nebraska State Journal, September 7th, 1867. And this is an article, uh, of course, I used that one must use a magnifying glass for. But uh, <clears throat> the following are excerpts from this article, and it was written in first person about the elections held in Kentucky and Tennessee right after the Civil War. Quote, therefore, I felt happy. Kentucky is a bright oasis in the desert built onto Ham and Hagar, believing in the superiority of the white race and that same race holding in their hands the privilege of saying who should and who should not vote, they was happy. And we sought in silence, contemplating our happiness. The nigger might be a man in Tennessee, but he shall be a nigger in Kentucky forever, because it always has been so. Bless the Lord. <clears throat> this is a picture of Dr. Matthew O. Ricketts of Omaha. He's the first African-American e elected to the Nebraska State Legislature. He served two years from, 19, uh, from 1893 to 1895. Dr. Ricketts was born of slave parents in 1858 in Kentucky, and they moved to Boonville, Missouri, where he attended public schools. He then graduated from Lincoln Institute in Jefferson City, Missouri, and that's where it became Lincoln University, and that's where I graduated from. And he worked his way through the Omaha Medical College as its janitor, graduating in 1884. And actually, <clears throat> the story that featured his picture was in a weekly, the Omaha Star, in 1974. And in the story, it states that Senator Ernie Chambers was the 11th African-American elected to the Nebraska legislature. <clears throat> this is a story in 1890 from the Omaha Bee. <clears throat> the Omaha Bee preceded the Omaha World Herald, and the headline reads, Happy Little Darkies. And below that is an advertisement for chocolates uh, using an African-American woman. And it seems to me in that year that I actually did this project, there was a judge in Nebraska that in court referred to an African-American woman as chocolate. And Senator Chambers, of course, took him to task for that. <clears throat> the story... Uh, of the little happy little dark, it says that the three little Negroes, black as the ace of spades, sang plantation melodies at one of the leading hotels, and they were given dimes and nickels. <clears throat> this is an article on the lynching of Will Brown, uh, September 28, 1919, in downtown Omaha. And the headline reads, lynchers of Will Brown indicted by grand jury. And this was in the Monitor, and this was a weekly before the Omaha Star. Will Brown had been accused of raping a white woman, and the lynch mob broke into the jail, dragging Will Brown out. The mob also tried to lynch the mayor because he resisted them taking Brown. In fact, uh, they, the mob had put a rope around his neck, but uh, someone rescued him. And this is a picture of the lynchers around the charred body of Will Brown. 
he was first beaten, he was dragged from the jail, then beaten, then shot, then hanged, and then burned. And all suspects were eventually released, despite the photo identification. You can see even today, of course, uh, Kyle, the two Kylies and John uh, used the original photo. And so, of course, you can see how clear it is, and you can see the faces of the people. There was no doubt about who the people were. <clears throat> this is a story about 2,000 women of the Ku Klux Klan who met in Lincoln in April of 1925. And in this story, under the heading of Influence of Klan, was this question, what about the insidious trend of the Protestant churches in the movement for world peace? What influence is behind this deplorable propaganda? This is an ad in 1935 using Black Joe to advertise coal. So those are just a uh, few of the images before 1950. And in order to simplify this presentation and meet the time constraints, I'm using just the 469 articles from the Lincoln Journal Star for the survey itself. I still use some of the articles from the Omaha World Herald, but not in the survey, to calculate what kind of stories were written at that time about African Americans. I also organized the news articles by five decades, starting with the 1950s, 60s, and so on. And I will share some decades I'll share just one story, other decades I'll share two stories. I want to acknowledge that there could have been many variable, variables that determined the news clippings uh, that were put into the African American files over a period of 50 years, as well as my own subjectivity in classifying the stories. Nevertheless, I'm confident that the hundreds of articles that I examined provide a fair assessment for this survey. In looking at the survey, as you can see, I found that there were 16 categories based on content and language used at that time in the news stories. Many of the categories overlap, but I've tried to be as specific as possible. Also, I should point out that civil rights, that category, includes racism and discrimination. The category of justice includes police and crime. And general includes entertainment, sports, fashion, women, census information, and so forth. Beginning with the 1950s, there were 35 clippings in that decade in the file, seven on civil rights and 28 on housing. There were no stories on the other 14 categories of history, education, black culture, politics, justice, Negro problems, health, income and employment, religion and church, general, business, black youth, family, and gains. <clears throat> this is one of the articles from the Lincoln Journal in the 50s, and the headline reads, City Argues to Maintain Negro Tavern. And the lead states, quote, the State Liquor Commission has been warned that if it approves the sale of the beer license now held by Lincoln's only Negro tavern, the whole problem of racial discrimination will be aggravated, unquote. The city attorney stated, quote, we do not want the problem of colored persons asking to be served 
in taverns which usually do not accommodate them. Uh, actually, I think what was going to happen, the State Liquor Commission was about to uh, issue the license to a white person who was going to have a white tavern. And so the city attorney went before uh, the council to say that we've got to keep this one Negro tavern open or we're going to have trouble. This is a story about an African American, oh, I must have skipped one. Okay, that was easy to do. <laughs> I'm surprised. <laughs> this is a story about an African American's home in Havelock that was set on fire in 1958. Sherman Brown and his wife and three children had been living in this all-white neighborhood for three months when, his, when the home was destroyed. Since they had moved in, they had been harassed day and night. In fact, Miss Brown had left with the children to visit relatives in Louisiana because she was afraid the children might be hurt while playing in the yard. And in the story, it tells how Mr. Brown was asked by the police to take a lie detector test to be sure that he didn't set the house on fire. <clears throat> this is, um, in the 1960s, there were 48 clippings. They have increased uh, almost by, uh, well, they increased <coughs> by 13. And beginning with 12 in history, six on civil rights, two on education, two on housing, three on politics, 11 on justice, two on Negro problems, and one on health, three on income and employment, one on religion and church, and four on black youth, and one on family, none on black culture, none on general business or gains. And uh, this is a, a story from the 60s. And this is an article that was in the journal in 1968. And the headline really tells what the story is all about. Lincoln Negro's wish to be accepted by whites as human being. And of course, the, there was some uh, upheaval in Lincoln in the 60s but not like it was in Omaha and in other parts uh, of the country. But often in the 60s, African Americans were asked, well, what do you people want? And so uh, this was what this story was about. In the 1970s, the articles almost doubled to a total of 81, beginning with 38 on history, and I should point out that most of the stories under history for each decade are about programs for Black History Month. As you may know, Black History Week was started by Dr. Carter G. Woodson in 1926, and uh, nationally it became Black History Month in 1976. And starting in the 1970s, the largest number of articles on African Americans appeared in the paper in the month of February. And also beginning in the 70s, there was at least one story about African Americans in every month of the year. So the stories were picking up. Continuing with the 1970s, there were 10 stories on civil rights, five on education, one on black culture, two on politics, two on Negro problems, two on health, nine on income and employment, four on religion and church, four on general, three on business, one on black youth, five on family, and three on gains, 
none on housing, and none on justice. Now, this is a story in the Lincoln Journal, uh, from the Lincoln Journal, and the, out of the, in the 70s, the paper, the Lincoln Journal, began to, to acknowledge somewhat that racism did sort of exist, and uh, they began to write some editorials about it. <clears throat> and this was, you, this was sort of unavoidable in a way because this is a story uh, with a headline, Neo-Nazis Build in Racist Nebraska. And one of the organizers of the National Socialist White People's Party stated, Nebraska has proved to be a very racist state. There's a lot of potential here. So, moving into the 1980s, the articles once again almost doubled to a total of 144, <clears throat> with a story in each category for the first time. 41 on history, 47 on civil rights, 10 on education, 1 on housing, 6 on black culture, 10 on politics, 1 on justice, 1 on Negro problems, 3 on health, 4 on income and employment, 4 on religion and church, 3 on business, 1 on black youth, and 5 on family, and 3 on gains. And continuing what was started in the 70s, the journal was really writing editorials of, against racism. And this is an editorial with the headline, Never Ending Fight. And it's about the job discrimination that FBI agent Donald Rashawn, who was first, uh, who first worked in the Omaha office of the FBI, and he was first harassed there. And on his desk, the story tells that he had a picture of his son and one of his fellow officers uh, pasted the picture of an ape over the picture of his son. The, the first African American to go into any of these agencies, they really faced a lot. My husband was one of those people. Uh, now to the next decade, the 1990s. <clears throat> Uh, the articles continued to grow. Let's see. I believe. Okay. Now, uh, in the 1990s, the articles continued to grow to a total of 161, with 49 in history, 18 in civil rights, 14 education, 15 on black culture, seven politics, eight justice, 14 Negro problems, 12 on health, seven religion and church, four general, five business, five on black youth, and three on gains, none on housing, income, and employment, and none on family. There were several editorials, though, in the 90s against racism, as I've said. And this is an editorial in the Lincoln Star in 1990. And the heading is, KKK is Crude Reflection of Deep Cultural Racism. And it tells that in the 1920s, 50,000 Nebraska men were members of the KKK. And there were 5,000 members in Lincoln. And I think the population in Lincoln was something like 48,000. There was also a chapter of the KKK at the University of Nebraska, and a fiery cross was implanted on the state capitol grounds one evening in 1924. This is an editorial in the journal 
disputing Senator Ernie Chambers' claim that, quote, most white Americans share in the attitudes of the Klan. That might be a subject to talk about in the conversations that the society is going to have, whether most white Americans agree with the Klan or not. Now, this is, this just shows uh, some of the percentages in the survey. 5% or 22 stories were on black culture in the span of 50 years, 5%. 3% or 16 stores were on religion and church, and 2% or 22 stores were on black youth, and 1% or 7 stores were on the black family in the 50-year span. In sharp contrast, in every issue of the Omaha Star, and the voice, there were stories on the culture and the family. In fact, for several decades, the Omaha Star carried a feature called Family of the Week with a picture often on the front page. And every week there were also stories and frequently pictures of youth, children, church news, club news, health, fashion, cooking, college news, editorials, births and deaths, weddings and family reunions, scholarships, inventions by African Americans, and so forth, as well as national and local stories on civil rights and others. And this is the front page from the Omaha Star dated October 13, 1950. And some of the headlines read, Near North Side Committee Chest Leaders. That was the community chest. Another headline, Methodist Man to Receive National Charter. Vets of Old Wars Eligible for Medicare Care. And Business Professional Women of the New Era State Confab Hold Second Meeting at the YWCA. <coughs> now this was a story, and these were stories in 1950. Um, this, let's see, I must have skipped one. No. Uh, this is also from the Omaha Star in 1950, and uh, there's a picture of a 25th wedding anniversary, a picture of a birthday luncheon, and a wedding picture, and other stories. You can see the wedding pictures at the bottom, and it's pretty clear. And this is a page from the Omaha Star, May 28, 1954. And the top picture is the Florida A&M University golf team, and they were champions that year. And below that is a story of Curtis Brown winning the Cornhusker Golf Club Field Day and Lily Livingston winning the women's competition. I point this out because until Tiger Woods came along, many Americans didn't seem to know about African American golfers. Actually, the golf tee was invented by a black man. Um, but also, a 16 year old African American, John Shippen, played in the second U.S. Open in 1896, tying for fifth place. I'd like to show you some of the pages from The Voice in Lincoln. And this is the front page featuring a family and news and stories about a national conference, a scholarship, church and community news, and health, also health news. And this is the editorial page, urging people to vote along with other stories. And this is, a, 
this is a page that has household hints, recipes, and other information. And this is a page, uh, this is a page that has church, campus news. African Americans were go were there were some going to college back then, sports and other news. And uh, I think you can read the headline, News from Quinn Chapel. And that's the first African American church in Lincoln, and it's still in the same place. Um, now, I would like to close with three observations. First, in almost every story, in both the Omaha World Herald and the Lincoln Journal Star, so-called race and our problems were central themes. Stories <laughs> were written about African Americans as if they did not live as individuals, as people, as human beings who got married, who had birthday parties, who loved their families, uh, as if they didn't live as mothers and fathers and wives and husbands, but rather as one big indistinguishable mass. Many of the articles were written about the Negro as if one were writing about a different species. Both newspapers, of course, have made many possible cha uh, positive changes in the images and types of co coverage of African Americans, and that started in the 80s and 90s and well on into 2000. And I, this is one of the new images from the Omaha World Herald that was published in 1996. It was very unusual to see a picture and a story, even back then, of an African American that didn't have something to do with him being black. But this was a story about a principal of an elementary school in Omaha who was featured in a series of articles on fashion in the Midlands, and I guess he was a dresser. <laughs> And of course, I, I do have to say that the Lincoln Journal Star, I don't have any of them, but uh, they, they were also beginning to kind of show images of African Americans as just people. And the Journal and the Star merged in 1995. Now this is my second observation that I want, would like to make. This is a story about Starkweather, Charles Starkweather. And of course, the young people weren't alive then, but you probably heard of Charles Starkweather. I think he killed 15 people. And the journal has a huge file on the Starkweather. It's big and thick. And I didn't read every word, but I scanned that file. And nowhere in that file does it say that stark weather was white. Nowhere does it mention that stark weather was a white person. Now we can all imagine the headlines if stark weather had been African American. So I would like to leave that challenge with you to just try to, try to, I'm still trying to understand why it was so important to tell the, to say that a person was black, but it wasn't important to say that they were white. And finally, when I was working on this project in one of the libraries, I won't say which one, a young woman who was helping me to get the articles said to me, you can really see that the African Americans didn't have a culture in the 50s and 60s, but then they began to get one in the 70s and 80s. Now apparently, that's what the omission of articles about African Americans 
as individuals and human beings. That's what it said to that young, educated woman. And of course, we still really don't have multicultural education in Nebraska schools. Not really. We don't have multicultural textbooks that tell the, that, that tell the story of, of people of color in every chapter of history with their contributions. And so this is what we get, this kind of unknowing. So that completes my presentation. I actually got those, uh, pushing those things okay. <laughs> that, that's a big deal for me. So. We, um, we have time for comments or questions, and I would be happy to answer anything I could about the survey. I actually did it in 2003, and um, that was the first time I gave the presentation. But I would be, yes. If I wanted to get a copy of your survey, is it available? On the web, available in historical society. Yeah, I was supposed to print it out, wasn't I? <laughs> well, I don't know. You could, uh, I guess. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Any other comments? Yes. Um, in the seventies, when um, Ed Poindexter and Mondo mm -hmm. um, were framed. Well, um, there were some, there were a few stories, and when I first did the project, I had uh, poster displays, but since this is primarily for TV, uh, John said not to worry about the poster display. Mr. Shanks, would you repeat the question? So that oh, I'm hear? sorry. Uh, the question is, what kind of coverage did Ed Poindexter and David Rice, uh, now known as Mondo Walenga, uh, who were, we believe, many of us believe, were framed for killing uh, a policeman in Omaha. What kind of coverage did they get? They, if there was some court hearing, uh, what I was going to say about the posters, uh, for the year of 1970, I had stories on the posters uh, of showing some of the articles that were published about their case. But unless there was a court hearing or something of that nature to report on uh, in the journal and in the World Herald, there weren't any stories about them. Now that began to change as the editors changed, certainly at the journal. And we began to get uh, stories that were, uh, what, that reported on a more like they were human beings and not just about the case. Yes. Uh, how has race, what, what do I think about the way race has been represented since Obama has become president? Well, of course, a lot of people say we're post-racial. <laughs> With the bills that have been presented in the Nebraska legislature, one, to, to eliminate the statue for multicultural education, um, to be mandated in Nebraska schools, I, I don't think that bill, I don't think that uh, speaks well of being post-racial uh, because in Nebraska we still really don't have 
multicultural education really being taught. I'm not sure, I don't know how the teachers' colleges teach the students to prepare them to come out so that they will be able to prepare these students for living in a global village. The world doesn't look like Nebraska. <laughs> I mean, three-fourths of the world's population are people of color. Three-fourths of the world's population. So uh, there's been a lot of revisionism in history. That's probably the biggest thing that I've noticed since uh, uh, Obama has been president. The uh, Mississippi state, uh, some of the people in Mississippi want to put Nathan Forrest on the, uh, on the um, car license. He was one of the founders of the KKK. And, he, and um, well, at any rate, um, it's been wonderful. There have been some very good things that have happened because we have an African American as a president, however. I mean, the news uh, hour and the news shows, they are suddenly finding all of these educated black people <laughs> who can sit on these panels and talk on any subject that anybody else can talk about. They were always there, but, but they were never asked to do it. But I think, I think having a black president it gives them permission to do that now. So that's, there's been some good fallout, but race I don't think, of course, is going to be our, is our biggest problem. It's, the gap between the rich and the poor that's getting wider and wider, and many of whom, of course, are black. Any, anything else? Any comments? Or mm. Yes. Did you, um, I know that you were focusing only on the, the, the Lincoln Papers for this presentation, but when you did your study of the uh, topics and uh, that for both the Lincoln Papers and the Omaha World Herald, did you find any difference there that would have reflected the larger number of African Americans in Omaha, or did, did the papers pretty much approach it in a similar fashion? No, I think the Lincoln paper approached it in a much in a much uh, fairer way. I think it approached it in a. I mean, just the number of clippings. There were 469 clippings, but in the Omaha, which is, of course, is a bigger newspaper, a bigger town, there were only 141 clippings. Oh, yes, I think um, uh, I'm, I'm avoiding using the word liberal. Uh, I'll just say I do think that the Lincoln paper was much, was uh, approached matters a little fairer than the Omaha World Herald did at that time. I think the Omaha World Herald has changed a lot now. Yes? From your survey, it's clear that the press was segregated as well as society over the years and has apparently become less so over time. Um, in your opinion, does the Omaha Star still serve a really important role in Omaha, or has that become less important over time? Does the Omaha Star still serve as important a role as it once served? I, I would say it still has a role. I think it still has a, an important uh, role. I don't uh, take the Omaha Star, but if, there, if something has happened in Omaha, and I haven't seen it or read about it, then I'll go to the library and look for that issue from the Omaha Star because that's where I'm going to find the story. And during the Civil Rights Movement, um, of, we worked primarily in the Civil Rights Movement in Kansas City, Kansas, and in the Civil Rights Movement, you couldn't get any coverage in the white papers. If there hadn't been black papers, you would have gotten any coverage at all. They just completely ignored you. And um, 
that those omissions have really generated generations of people who have grown up so misinformed and uninformed. And they're going to have to be quick learners. And maybe all of this technology for young people, maybe this technology will really kind of bring them up to date. Yes? Um, where is the uh, uh, first African-American church here in Lincoln? FC, is that ninth and? C. C. What is it? C. 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 Ninth and C? Uh, yes, Quinn Chapel. Yeah, that was in uh, 18, <coughs> seemed like it was 1860-something. I intended, I had the information at home, but I just didn't get around to looking it up. But it's, and some of the other African-American churches branched out from Quinn Chapel. Any, anything else? One over here, please. Oh, yes. <clears throat> in Colorado Springs, recently, in the public school, in the high schools, they are teaching, and Colorado Springs has a reputation for being conservative, they're teaching Howard Zinn's The People's History of the United States. Have you found in your readings about Lincoln and Omaha whether uh, anybody's using that history in high schools in Nebraska? I'm not in my readings, although she's speaking of Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States and that it's being used as a textbook in uh, high schools or at least one high school in Colorado Springs. Um, to, can you answer that question, Mr. Christie? There are some high school social studies teachers that use that as a supplement. I see, as, as a... a Okay. Okay, so did you hear that? You know, I don't know what it is about Nebraskans <coughs> that uh, people seem so timid to give people an inclusive history of this state and of our country. And it's really denying these students what they need to make it in a diverse world. That, that's really just in, this idea of clinging to some kind of superiority because of having white skin, that's obsolete. It's, it's, it's completely... Well, we knew that before the genome projects were completed. <laughs> Well, we did. We knew that before the genome projects were completed. But uh, since they are completed, we know there's just one race, biological race, the human race. And we need to teach them the history of white slavery so they will know that black people have, aren't the only ones that have been slaves and to, to give them an, some equilibrium in their education. The universities need to do that. The teachers' colleges need to do that so that these people come out and able to give these students a world view because that's what they're going to need to make it in the world, to be citizens of the world. And, you know, Nebraska has tried to keep very closed and keep the world out, but the world has come to Nebraska. <laughs> All of the people that have come to Nebraska. So, yes. Uh, I, as someone who came through Omaha Central High at a time when, even though there were black students there, there was almost no social interaction between white and black students. And uh, as a teacher in Lincoln, there was so much to be changed that um, it is, it's skin color, but women were written out of history and you could make a list of oh, yes. who wasn't important. And I think that there are efforts being made on that score. 
<laughs> yes. Uh, did, did, could you hear her? She was uh, saying how she went to, uh, in Omaha. There, the students went to school together, but there was no outside contact. You know, today at my age, it it just blows my mind to really think how we have separated ourselves from each other. It, it, it's just so, it boggles the mind how we have done that and how some of us continue to do that. When we, when people of different cultures and backgrounds enrich our lives. When we exclude people of color, we exclude three-fourths of the world's population. It, it's it's uh, having, knowing, being able to embrace anyone and everyone is so satisfying to one's own self-esteem. It would seem to me to be able to embrace anyone. When you get to this age, you really have an idea about what's important in life. And excluding people and feeling that you're better than somebody else, that's not the kind of thoughts you want to have, I don't think. Mrs. Shanks, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.